Peace, peace, love. I hope everybody's been prosperous. Uh, shalom. Uh, it's me, T.E. Speaks, T.E. Speaks, coming to you. Um, again, I just want to touch on uh, something brief, um, something that can be discussed, um, and, and something um, that uh, is just uh, theoretical. Uh, there's nothing that's been proven. Um, it's just uh, a, a careful observation um, that I wanted to share with everyone. So again, it's, it's only a theory. Um, on top of that, or along with that, I just want to clear the air. Um, I'm not Hebrew Israelite. I'm not cultish at all. Um, it's just from doing careful Bible study, uh, just to see a few things and, and maybe um, look at things a bit differently um, as I have with all of the, the videos I've done in the past. Um, but today I want to talk about Mesopotamia or Babylon and Spain and how they're similar. And um, I have a few or um, depictions that I want to share that that um, may share some some um, or show some of those um, similarities. So let's get started. As with all videos, I like to um, start off with a very brief background. Um, and, and we'll start here. Um, now, Mesopotamia is this area, roughly. Um, present day Iraq is what we know it as. Spain is this area. They are seemingly miles apart in our mind, but really um, they're as close as Canada is to the Caribbean. So um, just, just a little something to give a visual to show um, how these things can interconnect and how they can go together. Um, but along with that, um, I do want to also remind everyone, um, these are the Hamite settlements according to Genesis 10. All of these areas belong to the Hamites. And also according to scripture, they disperse throughout these lands. So it's not robbery to believe or to remind ourselves that these are where the Hamites settled. In fact, just to add a little bit more to that, we know that over in this area is um, what uh, is known as the, um, the Kushite mountain range. Um, so, um, these things are right in front of our faces, but it's never taught to us, so we don't know. And whenever somebody like me brings these things out, um, it, it becomes a problem because it seems like I'm, I'm going against um, ideologies and scriptures that are, are beneficial, but in reality, trying to help broaden the scope and our perspective on things. Um, but let's go ahead and get into, again, the similarities of Mesopotamia, Iraq, and Spain. So, what is the Hebrew word for Spain? The Hebrew word for Spain is Safarad. In the Bible lexicon, Safarad is mentioned as to mean separated, a place where the Israelites were exiled which is a site unknown. I mean, it brings out a, a passage in Obadiah, the uh, first chapter in the 20th verse. And um, it, as, again, just to reiterate, um, it says that it's a country elsewhere unknown whether the exiles of Israel were carried away. According to the Vulgate, according to um, the Syriac and the Hebrew writers, Spain, which is clearly incorrect 
So they don't believe that Spain is Safarai. I mean, even though it's right there in our faces. I mean, theory. This is all theory. Now, in the word Safarad is the word Safar. According to scripture, there's another Safar word, and it's Safar Bain. Now, Safar, as we've we've learned in, in videos past, is a border mountain range for the settlements of the children of Shem. Safar Bain, according to scripture, was a settlement inside of the Babylonian territory. So again, there's a connection because the Babylonians ruled that area that we know today as um, Saudi Arabia. Um, so it wouldn't be um, far-fetched or um, unplausible for um, Safar being in Yemen to be a boundary for the children of Shem. But uh, according to um, BibleHub.com, um, Safar Baim um, means the two books or the two scribes. Uh, it is mentioned by Sennacherib in his letter to Hezekiah. Um, I showed a picture also of Sennacherib's army um, as they led the captives um, away from Judah um, during the time of Hezekiah. And you could see the Jews with afros. Um, now, I, and I, I just want to be clear. Um, although I'm not um, Hebrew Israelite, I do believe that um, African-American people and those who look like us that are scattered throughout the world are um, the descendants of the biblical Hebrews. Um, and I, I do a lot to try to bridge that connection um, so that we can see from a different perspective and maybe um, have some things to go off of. Um, but um, in 2 Kings um, chapter 17, um, it says that the king of Assyria, which was Sennacherib, um, bought his people. So he migrated his people from Kutha, Ava, Hamath, Zepharbaim, and, and placed them in Samaria. Uh, and, and this immigration style is so similar to how America itself was immigrated. Once the powers to be got settled, they opened the borders to everybody who wanted to become a citizen of this area, um, and they put their own leaders in place. So um, I think it's just uh, another uh, similarity that can't be overlooked. So Mesopotamia and Spain um, apparently have a lot of um, commonalities. Um, and, and what I just showed was a, a small bit of Bible narrative. But I want to go also to um, a few historical pieces that were written about um, the area known as Mesopotamia. In the book, The History of the Jews, um, from the earliest times to the present day, um, it, it tells a lot about um, the settlements um, in Babylon. It tells a lot about the movements. It even goes into detail about who Jesus was and how they believed that um, just his uh, charismatic personality was able to sway people. Um, but this is a good read if you ever get the chance. Um, but again, I'm just going to highlight a few things just to show um, that connection between the Jews and Babylon and how they've always been together. So, on page 574, um, talking about the reign of Constantius, uh, it says that the Jewish teachers of the law were banished from Jerusalem uh, in consequence of a decree. Uh, and so, uh, several of them immigrated to Babylonia. A lot of them moved to Babylon or Mesopotamia. 
Now, this was during the Christian era. Um, this is the end of the book, so it, it's getting into the Christian area. Um, I'm sorry, era. And um, in this book, it tells us that marriage between Jews and Christian women, uh, which have which appear to have been of not infrequent occurrence, meaning it happened a lot, were punished with death under the Emperor Constantius. So uh, people, people were actually killed for marrying um, Christian women, uh, or in other words, Roman women or white women. Now it says that his father had only forbid the admission of slaves into the Jewish community and had simply punished the transgression of this prohibition by declaring forfeited all slaves so admitted. So he would just take their slaves. Um, Constantius decreed in 339 that the circumcision of a Christian slave entailed the pain of death and the entire loss of fortune. So um, it was not only unlawful to bring um, a Christian slave into the Jewish community, it was also unlawful to have a Christian slave circumcised. Um, and, and, and you just just knowing a few um, things throughout history about who the circumcised were, who the uncircumcised were, um, you, you clearly would get the picture. This go this talks about a uh, Jewish province in Babylon, how it was divided, um, the towns, um, and it says uh, such as a peculiar dialect or particular customs or manners or even in distinct weights and measures. So it tells you that the Jews were different than all the other people who lived in the area. They stood out um, just as we stand out today, just as um, Anywhere you go, uh, people stand out. Now, I just want to um, interject here. Again, these books um, are on Google. Um, you can type in this title. Um, you can get the book for free. It's a free download. Type in the name of the author. I um, mean, you can read this book for yourself. I, I do um, stand behind it. It's a very good read. Um, I think I read it in like two days. Uh, but it's a, a really good read. Now, um, the next book, History of the Jews during the Christian era, um, or during the dawn of the Reformation, was a book from 1851. Um, and I'm just going to highlight a few things here as well. Another good book that you can um, type into Google and um, get the free back. Um, but this out in 1492, which was the same year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue, um, that Spain uh, did a lot of terrible things to the Jews. Um, in particular, uh, it says that uh, this iniquitous, I'm sorry, iniquitous and ungrateful measure was adopted. The command was uh, peremptory. Every Jew was required to submit to baptism or to depart on the pain of death. Crime didn't have to be proved. They didn't have to be um, charged with anything. Um, and uh, they could warrant a, a, a cruelty such as this against the whole entire nation. On top of that, they were only given four months um, to get themselves together. Um, their movable property uh, was the only thing they were permitted to sell for bills of exchange. So uh, if they had houses, they couldn't sell their, ho their houses. Um, only thing they could sell was um, farming equipment, um, clothing, um, uh, you know, the, the like dishes, those types of things. Um, and check this out. Um, but their gold and jewels were not to be exported. So um, they couldn't take anything of value with them when they were exiled from Spain. And to me, that's just, um, that's a, a remarkable statement. Um, that, that's something to think about um, how an entire nation of people were bankrupt um, when they were kicked out of Spain. Now, and a lot of people would tell you, 
that these Jews so-called um, helped in the enslavement of Africans during the transatlantic slave trade. But if they were exiled from Spain in 1492, the same year that uh, Columbus supposedly found the New World, if, if Spain had this much disdain for them, how could they come in and make contracts and pacts and agreements with this nation to um, buy ships and and transport people? It's because they were not the true. Um, they were Jewish, uh, truly, but they were Jewish by conversion. Now, um, it talks here about the numbers of people. Um, some people say it was eight hundred thousand um the jewish writers reckon it was 120,000 families uh, or 600,000 souls so you got a lot of different um numbers um but again this page uh it, it goes into a little more detail on how this this looked um for the jewish people um during exile it says that um the ferocity of the robbers who upon land despoiled others of all their they possessed, the barbatory of the masters that they were prisoners of war, or threw the sick and infirm into the sea in order to seize upon their effects. So um, some of these people, because they couldn't take gold and jewels out, would swallow gold and jewels, and um, the sea merchants would actually kill them. Um, a lot of them cut them open, cut them to try and get their gold and what have you. This next book, um, The Jews and Moors in Spain, uh, was uh, it was written in 1887. This basically tells how um, you, you had a lot of Jewish boys and girls become leaders in um, the the Christian quote unquote church. Um, page two fourteen it says all Jewish children below fourteen years of age were torn from their parents' arms, dragged into the church, baptized. Those under three years of age were given to Christians to receive a Christian education, or in other words, to be raised as slaves. Those between three and 10 years of age were put on board of a ship and conveyed to the newly discovered unwholesome island of St. Thomas, um, also known as Sao Tome. Um, those between the ages of 10 and 14 were sold as slaves. Then indeed, the cup of their affliction was full to the brim. So this tells how um, the children were made slaves. Sure. Entitled Black Rulers of Europe shows a young black boy who's become a church leader supposedly taking care of another young black boy who is destitute um, in need of help um, you can see his bones showing. Um, he's got bread in his hand. But um, this is just, um, I guess, a, a, a pull together of, of what it looked like for those young boys and girls who were taken from their parents who had been exiled from all these different European countries and um, became heads and leaders in the, the um now, uh, we've gone over a little bit of um, scripture. Um, we've shown um, a little bit of um, historical writings, but let's look at um, what we see before us. Now, this young lady says, uh, Sephirot, um or Jewish Spain, uh, this young lady is a depiction of what the Sephardic Jews look like. 
or, or who they call the Sephardic Jews. Her resemblance to these young ladies is also um, amazing. Um, these young women are Kurdish warrior women, uh, which is that area of Mesopotamia today. So the woman of Sephora or of Spain, the, the Sephardic Jew, looks a lot like these Iraqi women. And, and look at these uncanny resemblances. Um, Sephardic Jews of Morocco versus uh, modern day Iraqi people. Um, uh, again, um, it, this is just uh, a thing that I have. Um, and, and I think a lot of this um, brings it really together. And let's look at a little architecture before we go. On the left is a mosque in Baghdad. On the right is a mosque in Spain. Now, one thing about architecture, um, we've been made to believe that architecture has a type based on religion. But if, if we're careful, we can see that architecture's type comes from the people that's always done it. So the people of Spain and the people of Baghdad or the people of Iraq or Mesopotamia have always done the same things. Again, a mosque in Baghdad versus Spain on the right. Baghdad on the left, Spain on the right. Always the same. Everything looks the same. Clearly, it's not a religious architecture. So, again, this is just a little something to make you think and see differently. I'm not to dissuade you from the faith. In fact, I believe um, if you study, um, it makes your faith stronger. Um, it brings us closer together because if you're truly Christian, you cannot look at um, your African-American brother and sister um, who's in the streets screaming Black Lives Matter, who's um, in pulpits every Sunday morning um, giving a word or, or um, admitting a fault, um, just whatever, as people who have no merit, um, because I don't believe these things are coincidence. Um, but nonetheless, um, I appreciate you. I, I really do. Um, subscribe um, to the channel. Um, like the video. Um, leave comments um, in the comment section. If you have questions. Um, I'm, I'm willing to address whatever I can. But most importantly, um, I just want everybody to be blessed. I want everybody to be prosperous. Um, so again, Shalom. Um, I love you. Peace.